Welcome to the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel powered by InsideTexas.com. I'm Joe Cook. We have a very special guest today, SEC Mike from That SEC Podcast, one of the biggest fans of football in the southeastern footprint, someone who knows what's going on in the 12 and soon to be 14 team league from Texas all the way to South Carolina and everywhere in between. Mike, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Joe. You came on last week and uh, that was a great interview. So any Longhorns out there that want to, that's probably the best place for them to start on that SEC podcast if they haven't seen it. And and Joe's already given me grief for this uh, 12th man towel I got up here. It, most of the stuff you see behind me are, is things fans have sent into the show. So I don't know what exactly that would be for, for Texas, but if anybody wants to send me something, I'm happy to display it in my background here. I bet everybody's got a lot of different ideas, but we see the the white helmet right there. So we know that you've got some some Longhorn fans who have tuned in. But Mike, you know, we met last year at, at SEC Media Days. And uh, one of the things we talked about was, hey, Texas wasn't in yet, but they were going to get a little bit of an introduction by playing Alabama. And that was a first taste. But I want you to kind of go back to the 2021 SEC media days when it leaked via the Houston Chronicle that Texas and Oklahoma would be joining the SEC. Obviously, the first big move in realignment in some time. What was your first reaction when you first heard that the Longhorns and the Sooners were going to be headed to the SEC in a few years? Well, <laughs> whenever I think of that, I don't know. Probably I shouldn't be this way, Joe, but I mean, I. It's not that I hold grudges or anything, but I just remember them going on SEC Network. It, you know, it was a live event. The entire thing's covered, and they're sitting there saying, "No, this ain't. This is baloney. Like, it's, there's no way this could happen." And then about an hour or two into the event, they said, "Okay, yeah, this has basically been confirmed. It was so fast tracked." But what I what I think of that is, I also think of, uh, "Oh, what a coincidence, coincidence! We had Ross Bjork there." who was basically saying, hey, we, we were told we are going to be the only Texas program in the SEC. Well, get the heck out of here, Ross. There's a reason he's at Ohio State. He's an awful AD. But uh, yeah, that stands out. But really, I mean, I was just overjoyed. I was hoping it would happen a lot sooner than, than 2024. I was hoping 2023. But, I mean, it's just – the SEC and Texas fans can now admit it. I mean, we're we're the best of the best. They win nearly every national championship. Got the best players, the best coaches, the best fans, the best traditions, and literally could not have done any better than adding Texas and Oklahoma. I think they're going to fit like a glove. You know, we didn't have to expand to Los Angeles. We didn't have to expand to Washington and Oregon and and make a joke of our our league. The, these are. I already feel like Texas and Oklahoma were up. The caliber of the SEC. I think they were the only two in that former conference they were in that that were SEC caliber. So now that they're in, I mean, it's a super conference. And I know everybody points to the Big Ten and they say, well, that's a super conference too. Not really. Not my mind. Not when you win some, what is it, three, maybe four national championships in 50 plus years. And Washington, Oregon, U, USC, UCLA, they're not going to bring any value to that conference, I really don't think, other than potentially TV markets. So, yeah, the SEC is just the best is getting that much better with Texas and Oklahoma coming in, and I can't wait for it. You know, I think I told you that, uh, and I was on maybe around then, that I drove from Austin all the way to Tuscaloosa, and you mentioned that it's all one contiguous region. That's something that Chris Del Conte, uh, the Texas athletic director, really harped on a few weeks ago, and he talked about how for him and for Texas, it's it's a homecoming um, you know, I, I, I may kind of quibble with that considering those are the events of a hundred years ago, but <laughs> it is Texas seemingly taking a, I don't want to say a rightful place, but I almost want to among the programs that are going to be the power players in whatever form college football takes. And I know that you are a big fan of SEC everything. We're looking at top 10, top 15 teams in men's basketball, women's basketball, baseball, a bunch of different sports, but you are football focused and finally, it seems like Texas and, and, of course, Oklahoma are bringing a type of program that, like you said, fits into the SEC and seems like from from our perspective, the, the transition will be pretty seamless for everybody involved. Yeah, and I, I can't believe it. I mean, I guess I should have seen this coming, Joe, but there's already so many rivalries that are built in. Like, I know your audience probably doesn't care too much about this, but Oklahoma, Missouri, they like hate each other's guts now. So it's like. 
Hey, you know, I, it was weird when Missouri came into the league, even when A&M came into the league. Uh, it just, I don't want to say they didn't fit, but certainly Missouri took took quite a while. I mean, it, there's not going to be that that fitting in for Texas and Oklahoma because, I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but uh, I think basically the entire SEC hates Texas, which I would embrace, you know. Uh, I, I think everybody wants to beat Texas, and I think Texas wants to beat everybody because they want to prove how elite they truly are getting out of the junior leagues and coming into the, the Super Conference. And then Oklahoma, there's there's so many natural rivalries already. Clearly, I just mentioned Missouri, but uh, there's there's been quite a back and forth with Tennessee fans, with uh, even Florida, strangely. And they're going to try to make LSU Oklahoma a rivalry, rivalry. They're playing rivalry weekend. So when I talk to Oklahoma people, I ask them what's the game they're most looking forward to, other than obviously the Texas game. They say LSU, which kind of caught me off guard, but. I think that's an indication of uh, the SEC is going to really try to make that a rivalry. And, man, it, this is just going to be so much fun. And I'm a big believer. You know, I, I'm not a huge fan of, of the 12-team playoff. And, gosh, I hope it doesn't expand more, even though it sounds like it's going to, because I think, that, I, I think that takes away from what makes college football special. But having said that, I'm not going to sit here and complain as, as we're already in this new era. So I'm going to embrace it. And we're just getting so many great games, Joe. I mean, Georgia-Texas, that's like a national championship game. We're getting it in the middle of the season. We're getting even – and here's the thing I think Texas fans are, are – I think they're getting ready for it, but they they don't understand it till they lived it. I mean, games like Florida and Kentucky, and I know you think they're not on your caliber, and they're, they're probably not this year. But, you know, those teams will get you. They'll, they'll beat you. I mean, Tennessee was headed to the college football playoff two years ago. Then they had to go to South Carolina and lost by about 40 points. You know what I mean? Like, that can happen in this conference. So just the weekend, week out games that we're getting, and it's not just the, the marquee games. It's not just Georgia, Texas, and ones of that nature, Oklahoma, Tennessee, but basically every SEC game, short of Vanderbilt. <laughs> I'll give them Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt should, should go to the Big 12. That's, that's probably where they belong. But everyone else will give you a game, even Mississippi State when they have that thing rolling, even Kentucky. So I, I just can't wait to see Texas and Oklahoma face this week in, week out SEC grind. I want to pick at, at one thing that you mentioned, and, and you said that everybody in the SEC already hates Texas. We've kind of been operating on under the assumption that it's pompous, but there is a level of truth when you hear things like an Iowa State offensive lineman say that their biggest game is outside of the Iowa game is Texas. When you see West Virginia and TCU and Baylor and all these different student sections pay Texas to put the horns down logo, a trademark of Texas on T-shirts, we had kind of been operating the, under the assumption that like Texas was everybody's big game, the one circled in the Big 12. And then of course, Oklahoma, that makes sense. But you're saying that everybody in the SEC already hates Texas. This isn't to start a horns down argument because that's a silly argument, a silly discussion. But you're already saying that like because Texas is who they are, they're already going to be a circle date on a lot of different teams' calendars. Well, I'm just saying here in the SEC, we hate everybody. Uh, I mean, you just look around. I mean, Tennessee and Kentucky hate each other. But you can't get into that discussion without Tennessee fans bringing up coal miners. You can't get into it without Kentucky fans talking about, uh, you know, how it's against the law to marry your cousin, on and on. I mean, there's just hate all around, and it, it'll, it'll bubble up. I just referenced uh, South Carolina whooping Tennessee when they Tennessee should have went to the college football playoff. Had they taken care of business? But, I mean, even that's like a rivalry now. The last couple – I mean, Beamer and, and Heupel hate each other. And I don't even know where that came from other than that whooping they gave them a couple of years ago. But, yeah, I mean, I know Arkansas clearly hates Texas, Texas A&M. That goes without saying. Oklahoma hates – I mean, go all down the list. Uh, I, I just think that, uh, that Texas – I'm not saying they're going to be like the defining game. I mean, Georgia, I don't think Georgia gives two rips about – about Texas, I really don't now. If Texas beats them, that'll ch that'll change really quick. But uh, I I just think that uh, the level of hate that Texas is going to get, and it's more, I think it's more about preseason rankings because I, a lot of people hate Tennessee too. But I think it's on another level with Texas because Tennessee can get hyped up, 
and then they just get humbled every year in the SEC. So I think a lot of SEC fans expect kind of that same thing is going to happen to Texas now that they're not having to play in the Big 12. And I'm, I'm not saying that is going to happen, but I'm fascinated to see if it will. Hey, what's that old saying? You can't spell citrus bowl without UT, right? Well, that's that's a Tennessee thing from, from Spurrier. Kind of coming back towards the the this past season, how important was it for Texas to win the Big 12 championship, be impressive, go to the college football playoff? And even when you think about both teams coming over, how important was it for Oklahoma to win 10 games in second year of Brent Venables? How important is it? for the SEC, for both these schools, and then for everybody involved, that both the new members in the SEC are on an upswing as opposed to maybe being a middling, you know, eight and four, you know, or like they were last year, eight and five and six and seven. How important is it that they're both stepping in on a strong foot? I think it's more important for Texas and Oklahoma that they did that because I, you, you look at what uh, Sarkeesian was able to accomplish, winning the conference, making the college football playoff, and then sending a bunch of guys to the NFL. I think, and with their NIL game, which is perfectly legal, there's there's no reason to hide from any of that. But given all those factors, they're able to attract so much talent via the transfer portal to, to where we get this offseason of hype, where the expectation in a 12-team field, I mean, I, th I think it would be a massive, massive disappointment if Texas probably doesn't even... I'm not not even make the playoff, but like doesn't win at least one game. You know, I mean, I mean it's championship expectations. Not that, you know, falling if they make the final four or the final game, I'm not calling it a failure. But but basically, I mean, their preseason everywhere I've seen like three or four at, mm -hmm. at worst. You know what I mean? So th this is an elite, elite team. So I think that was big for Texas to get the buy-in, to get that continued NIL money going, to get recruiting going, to to come into this conference. Guns a blazing, and it was obviously paramount for Oklahoma as well. Because I, at last media days, I was asking the Oklahoma people we talked to, is you know if Brett Venables is is he even going to be the coach when Oklahoma makes it to the SEC? Because I think that was a fair question, given how poor they looked his first year. But they clearly did a, a one eighty, particularly on the defensive side of the football. So I think, and I don't know if this says more about Oklahoma or it says more about the SEC right now, but. I think Oklahoma will enter the the SEC with one of the best defenses next year. Now, maybe not the best, but top five, which I would not have thought about a year ago. So I think that's impressive. And I, I've heard Jeff Lebby tell people, and you, and you look at the quarterbacks Jeff Lebby has worked with, that Jackson Arnold is the most talented quarterback he's ever worked with. That's, that's his word. So, I mean, if he lives up to that hype, I think Oklahoma – could do a lot better than people are anticipating their first season in the SEC. I got to tell you, a lot of our viewers hope that you're very wrong, <laughs> but I'm, I'm excited, you know, to see that Cotton Bowl, which uh, I hope you get a chance to experience someday. Uh, split 50 50, crimson and cream on one side, burnt orange on the other. And finally, this year, big old SEC logo on the 25 yard line. Uh, but getting specific to Texas, you know, obviously we talked about it, college football playoff. Um, when that first, when that move was first announced back in 2021, about a month later, Texas had to go to Fayetteville, Arkansas, and they got dog walked by the Razorbacks. And of course, the Jeers came. A, a five and seven season ensued. Uh, but then you saw last year or two years ago, I guess at this point, improvement to eight and four uh, in a regular season, lost to Washington, and then this past season, 12 and one before losing to Washington on the last play. What's impressed you about what Steve Sarkeesian has done so far at Texas after kind of having his toe in the water in the SEC being Nick Saban's offensive coordinator for two seasons? I think going to, uh, well, really it was both years, but more specifically last season in Tuscaloosa, dominating Alabama on the line of scrimmage because, yeah, a Alabama was not Alabama of old, uh, particularly on the offensive line last year, but there were many people, and it, I'm not saying this to call these people out because they're they're more knowledgeable about some of this stuff than I am, but guys like Cole Kublick, who I've, I've got a ton of respect for, his knowledge on offense, he played offensive line at Auburn. He's going to know more about the offensive line than, or, or he'll forget more than I'll ever know. But he was coming into the year saying this is going to be the best offensive line in history of SEC. And Texas came in there and, and just dominated them. So 
the fact that you were able to, and you you referenced that Arkansas game, that's where they lost it They because they got dominated by Arkansas mm -hmm. on the line of scrimmage. And to go from that to dominating Alabama in Tuscaloosa, that just really opened my eyes on, on just the, the 180 that Sarkeesian was able to do on that line of scrimmage. And really even, well, I guess it would be two years ago, they, they should have beat Alabama. I mean, it, there were some horrendous calls and – Particularly that safety. I still don't know how they how they called that one, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Pro probably should have beaten Alabama two years in a row, but just the fact that they're able to do that shows you that Texas can play with anybody. But again, I I, I hate to keep repeating the same points, but you can do it one game. Can you do it eight times? Because that's that's life in the SEC, and I'm not saying Texas can't, but. Even Steve Sarkeesian doesn't know that answer till to when they actually have to face it. So I mean that that and with the expanded playoff with no divisions, divisions has hurt the SEC. It's it's just been ridiculous how it's been set up for years. I mean, Georgia has never visited College Station. Mm -hmm. They're going to visit Austin before they visit College Station, and A and M's obviously been in the year in the league for over a decade. So I mean, it was just stupid the way they were doing it. They fixed that thankfully. But it's a new world for for all these SEC teams, not just Texas and Oklahoma, and it's going to be fascinating to see how it all plays out with uh, with just even teams like Kentucky that have kind of some people look at that as an overachiever. A lot of people think they're going to regress now because they have to they play Texas, they play Auburn, they have to they don't just get Mississippi State and uh, it, you know a rotating West opponent, so it kind of levels the playing field in many ways for, for not just Texas and Oklahoma, but the entire SEC. Aside from the, the weekly grind factor, which I think is, is true uh, for sure, because when you're, you're facing depth of some teams, when you're facing depth against Houston and maybe even Texas Tech, they're, you know, got good players, college football players, but they're, they're probably three-star guys. When you're facing depth against even Ole Miss and, and other teams, Florida, LSU, those are four-star guys. Those are starters for a lot of teams around the country. So it's going to be a little bit different, obviously, but aside from the weekly grind factor and, and the depth factor, what are maybe some concerns or, or fears that you have about Texas in 2024, despite their very lofty preseason rankings here in March? Well, I also think, uh, and I guess this is going to be disrespectful. I was go I was about to say I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I kind of do. Uh, I think going on the road too is significantly tougher in the SEC than it will be in the Big Twelve, and I think you would, you and your audience would admit that as well. I mean, I, I don't know much about Iowa State. I hear that can be a house of horrors, but I mean, I would probably line up about eight or nine SEC venues over just about anywhere short of uh austin and, and even norman i've heard is like nothing nothing special outside of the the actual atmosphere itself so i i just think go i referenced tennessee going to south carolina that was i mean that that derailed a potential national championship team uh you know going up to lexington which you may roll your eyes at but mm -hmm. i mean lsu has been dominated up there florida is on a three-game losing streak to Kentucky. I mean, they can't Which get over. Which is crazy them. considering that used to be the other way for what, decades, right? I think it was 30, 34 years in a row Florida beat Kentucky. <laughs> and now oh, and now yeah. they can't beat them. So, uh and Billy Napier is going to get fired if he loses to Kentucky for the for the you know, third time in a row. I I guarantee it. But I I just think the venues, the fans, you know the atmosphere. It, I mean, it's it's insane down here, and I'm I mean that in the best way possible. It's the only way I have a job, Joe. Is these people are. I mean, I you can't even insult South Carolina by saying they're going to go seven and five, which would be two games better than last year. I mean that that's a personal affront to Gamecocks, and, and they'll let you anything you get wrong. They they bookmark it. They throw it in your face for twelve months of the year, and I, and I love it because it's that passion, it's that intensity. It's basically all we have. It's it's all we care about. Yeah, I know it, we're in the we're recording in March basketball. That's great. They care about that in Kentucky. That's about it. That's the only other place. As soon as the the tournament's done, I mean I know people that are so more fired up about spring football than are the upcoming NCAA tournament. And, and that's just the way it is down here. Yeah. And I, I wrote an article on inside Texas and it kind of looked at all the different uh, stadium sizes 
Um, if you look at the the SEC average and you, you substitute the Cotton Bowl for uh, Oklahoma Stadium, it's about 80,000. Uh, whereas if you check out the Big 12, I think it's like in the, the 60s. Like it's almost 10,000 more people uh, than that that can fit into these stadiums on average than, than what Texas is used to. So uh, I can I completely uh, agree with you. It's going to be the volume is going to be raised, as as I put it. And that's uh, definitely a big factor because we saw, you know, an older team or an experienced poised team can go into places that have 100,000. But if you don't have a experienced or poised team, it, it can fall apart. It fell apart pretty quickly. Um, I guess culturally, let's, let's not think about maybe on field uh, but maybe some off-field stuff. Austin, and I'm not saying this as a uh, to to boost Austin or to to talk it up or to denigrate it, but it's just outside of Nashville. It's the only big city in this conference. I've been to Starkville. My wife's from Mississippi, from the Starkville area. I know what it's like. It is an awesome town, uh, but a city of a million, it is not. And same with Tuscaloosa. <laughs> same with Baton Rouge. So if Texas fans start going around all these different places, um, whether it be places like Columbia, where they have some experience, uh, Columbia, Missouri, or Columbia, South Carolina, where they have none, what do they, what do they need to know about just going to these places, being a football fan, and being members of this league? Yeah, just be careful. Uh, safety first. <laughs> don't maybe don't wear your team gear out uh, on Friday night, especially if you like to talk trash and, and uh, you know enjoy yourself at the bar because it, it it may turn from a fun environment to a nightmare pretty quick. But I kind of kid, but not really, Joe. Because I mean, you go around this conference. I mean, it 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 is intense, and you know, it didn't really hit me till you take a trip. One time, uh, I guess this was back in like 2013, I went to the Tennessee at Oregon game and basically everybody I ran into, they they embrace you with open arms and they're like, thank you for visiting. Yeah. And I was just like, I mean, it's a complete 180. I, they don't want you in their establishments here in the SEC. It's 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 a battleground, you know, it's and it's it's something that is I, I kid it's it's safe, but it's uh you're gonna get trash talked you're gonna get mocked you know that it's it's an unfriendly confines it would be mm. the best way for me to explain all that on a game day but it is a heck of a lot of fun if you can take you know ribbing and everything to, to that nature but i i do think that is going to be one of the best things of this whole joining of texas and oklahoma is the fan experience of texas fans getting to go all across the sec of sec fans getting to visit Austin and Norman and hopefully the Cotton Bowl uh, at some point. Uh, we're, we're gonna, our plan is to make it to that first Texas-Oklahoma SEC or <laughs> maybe it will be the SEC championship game, but that game in Dallas is where we're, we're hoping to go the, this first year that it's officially an SEC game. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just – it's wild. And safety first, like I said <laughs> – you got to be careful out there. That it's not going to be friendly confines for for anyone wearing uh, burnt orange on a on a Friday night across the SEC. I can I can promise you that. Do you want to put a uh, put make a specific point to who the most hostile you've dealt with is? Uh, I mean Georgia and the and their barking fans. They're they're unique. I, I would you will get say barked that. at. <laughs> I've been I've had a beer dumped on me in in the swamp, and this was when I was like eight years old i mean they're they're ruthless there uh tennessee fans you know they're a special breed of, of crazy and and i'm i'm i don't get to that level but i am an alumni of there so you know you could really believe me if i if i'm telling you they're crazy uh that that is just on another level uh those are probably the three that stand out as the most vicious but i, I know arkansas fans can get pretty hairy too so uh yeah, I mean, basically all of them is is the correct answer. My my friend uh, Kat, she can attest that walking down Gibson Street with burn orange after a, a game at Razorback Stadium is not a not a great call. <laughs> um, looking at the schedule, I mean, I think I know what your answer is going to be, but there seems like there's so you could take this a number of different ways between the Georgia game, between the for, the Red River Shootout, between the Texas and Texas A&M rivalry, heck, even the first game uh, with Mississippi State, which is the game on Texas schedule you have circled on your calendar? A&M at, at the end of the season in Kyle Field. I mean, that's that's the one I've been dying for over a decade to to get to, and I'm not – I don't even have a 
association with either one. And I'm not from Texas or anything like that, but I'm just a, I'm a diehard college football fan and the sport is not the same without this game. And that, you know, it's just, I just always remember that around the holidays. It was just, it seems like there's a lot of epic games, big time players stepping up. It's just, and, and not only that, Joe, but it's been nonstop. I mean, I love like Billy Lucci and, and all these people and, and, and all they do is they bicker on Twitter. And, and I'm like so sick of, of just the tweeting. And, and I know there's, there's Texas fans that do it just as bad. So I, I'm not trying to call out Billy or anything. He's a friend of the show, but you know, it's just, it's just, it's both sides just, just bickering, 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 bickering for 10, 10 plus years. And that all, it's not going to end, but someone's going to have, uh, you know, rivalry rights here late in the season, rivalry weekend. I, I think that's, that, I know everybody circled Georgia at te Texas. I'm much, much more fired up about Texas at Texas A&M. That's my favorite game of the year uh, in the SEC next season. That's going to be awesome because it's, like you said, I remember when I was in college back in uh, 2015, the rival, the online rivalry may have reached its peak in the 2015 recruiting class. And that was when Kyler Murray uh, was being recruited by both schools. Uh, guys like Malik Jefferson, Dalen Mack, just a bunch of different guys were being recruited. And there was just internet battle after internet battle. And you just are like, play on the field. Like, what are we doing here? And um, we've had opportunities. I think Texas has appeared in what two Texas bowls in Houston. That's a Texas versus SEC matchup. And you talk to one side and it'll say, Oh, you avoided the Longhorns. You talk to the other side. Oh, you avoided the, the Aggies. And it, it's finally nice to know that the SEC league office has viewed this game as indispensable as everybody else has, uh, and is worth putting back onto the schedule. Um, I guess one last question and then I'll, I'll let you get out of here. Um, just overall excitement level from other fans. I, I think we may have touched on this a little bit, but like when you talk to Ole Miss fans, and there are a lot of Ole Miss fans and Alabama fans, LSU fans, Oklahoma fans who are from the state of Texas, and that's not just the Nick Saban factor. That's you know the allure of Greek life. That's sometimes uh, admissions, you know, the differences in standards between Texas and other schools. Um, they instead of going to smaller schools in the state of Texas. They'll go out to Ole Miss. Some go to Georgia. Um, and it seems like there's not only the, the Texas contingent at a lot of those schools, but the native contingent. Uh, but what's just your overall excitement from fans, whether it be South Carolina or Kentucky or Florida, just about Texas joining and becoming part of this family in a league that's going to basically dominate the sport and control how the sport go goes for the foreseeable future. Yeah, it's honestly, it's quite mixed Joe, because I, I see fans like Kentucky and South Carolina and even Missouri before they won 11 games last year. They were, I think they were looking around like, how are we going to compete? It was already an uphill climb. And now we're adding Texas and Oklahoma. It just, it doesn't seem <laughs> like they'll ever get there, but that is the beauty for all these people that complain about the transfer portal and NIL, I think it helps potentially if you got strong leadership, if you got everybody aligned, and we see that with Ole Miss, you reference, I think they're a legitimate, not just college football playoff contender, I think they're a legitimate national championship contender. I think Missouri, if you look at their schedule, I mean, they're going to be favored in probably 10 games this year. They, they go to Alabama, they host Oklahoma, and, and there's one other uh, that, that escapes me, but they basically have three games they got to win. And, and if they go two and one, they're going to go to the, they're going to be 11 and one and go to the college football playoffs. So that would have been crazy to say four years ago that Missouri is going to go to the college football playoff, but it's, it's probably going to happen if they take care of business. So it, it shouldn't be a detriment that Texas and Oklahoma are coming in. It should be an advantage. And I think it will be because we're already seeing it with, with those schools and it, other schools, if they get it in line, I mean, Arkansas can get there South there's if Missouri can make the playoff, literally anybody in the sec can make it. If the, you know, if not every year, but if, you know, you got key players coming back, you got a great coach and you pick up in the transfer portal. I think the blueprint is there. And I think a lot of people are going to be studying Ole Miss this year to see if they can make some noise. Cause if they can, that's another one. I mean, there's, I'm not trying to downgrade Ole Miss, but there, there's nothing Ole Miss has that every other SEC program short of Vanderbilt doesn't. 
So it, it can be accomplished essentially everywhere. Again, it'll take luck. You know, you, you'll need key players not to get injured and things of that nature. And they're spending a ton of money. But uh, I, I just think that is the beauty of the current system that we're in. And, and that's a, just another wild card. I, I, I hate going into the season, Joe, where we're like, okay, it's going to be Texas and Georgia. They're going to play in the regular season. Let's let's have them play in the SEC championship, and then let's have them play in the in the playoff. I mean, for years and years, that was you know obviously Alabama and LSU or Alabama and Georgia, and I just hate when it's two or three teams that dominate it. I love when it's wild cards and and you never know what to expect, and that's what makes college football fun to me. Man, I'm with you. I think you and I have a lot of similar opinions on the sport in general and in the playoff, but. Uh, I think you and I both can agree that this is going to be one of the most fun conference races ever, uh, and it coincides with the Longhorns and Sooners' first year in the SEC. Mike, man, I appreciate it so much. We'll see you in Dallas for Big 12 – or excuse me, sorry, that's in Vegas for <laughs> SEC media days, won't we? Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll be there. Uh, we're the rednecks with uh, all the drank Mountain Dews on our table. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just can't wait for that event too. It's, it's going to be one heck of a time. It's going to be fun. I'll show you the good places to to go eat and uh, maybe enjoy some other stuff. So, Mike, thank you so much. You're the host of the SC, That SEC Podcast. You can find that on YouTube and every other podcast service. It's also at thatsecpodcast.com, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, we got the website. We're legit and everything. So, uh, yeah, and just if you search SEC Mike, I think, I, I think I'm the only one with that name. I hope so anyway. I think so as well. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining. I appreciate this. Can't wait to do this again, maybe closer to the season. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you give it a like, subscribe, so it can bring more great content like this your way. And we will see you next time on the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel powered by InsideTexas.com.